Let's spend a couple of minutes to talk about renal transplant rejection. As you know, this would be a form of immune attacking, not of our body's own tissue, but usually either allografts from the same species or xenografts from uh, other species. In the case of uh, renal transplants, uh, we're talking about allografts. We see three classical patterns of renal transplant rejection. In the hyperacute, which is just minutes, it's often before the patient gets off the table, we have a tremendous antigen-antibody reaction uh, against the vascular endothelium of the donor kidney. So those never take, and we know that immediately. In acute rejection, now we're talking about perhaps days to months, we can see the body attacking the graft by uh, infiltrating the uh, graft with cells. Well, one pattern would be an interstitial infiltrate. Another is more of an antibody uh, phenomenon in which the uh, allograft uh, develops a vasculitis due to the presence of antibodies attacking the endothelium of the graft. And of course, in the third type of rejection, which is very, very common, uh, any uh, graft that lasts more than, you know, a few weeks or months is going to eventually, 50% of them will eventually fail. And it's a slow process, and like many slow processes, the end result is a uh, fibrosis. Here in acute uh, cellular uh, phase of rejection, we could see uh, renal tubules, and they're infiltrated by neutrophils, or, no, I'm sorry, these are probably lymphocytes. Neutrophils is not what I meant to say. In the acute humoral uh, pattern of rejection, we could see a reaction against uh, donor blood vessels by antibodies causing a, a pattern of vasculitis. And of course, in a chronic pattern of uh, rejection, chronic by virtue of its name always implies a long-standing process. And by long-standing process, we're talking about fibrosis. And here you have interstitial fibrosis between the tubules. And here you have fibrosis involving uh, not only the lumen of a blood vessel, but causing a complete uh, obstruction as well. Now, we have opened the door to the massively growing family of autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are defined as diseases in which the body fails to recognize itself as tolerant. So in other words, it attacks its own antigens, its own tissues by a whole wide variety of mechanisms. Tolerance, uh, the concept of tolerance can be thought of as being central and peripheral. And central tolerance, uh, basically the self-reactive lymphocytes would theoretically attack the own body, uh, uh, die. In peripheral tolerance, uh, there's a variety of mechanisms which are normal. And one is to have the uh, abnormal cell that would normally be attacked uh, deleted by apoptosis or sequestered uh, figuratively by the fact that its antigens are being masked from cells which would normally attack it. Uh, in peripheral tolerance, we normally have concepts like energy or suppression by T cells. Autoimmune diseases run in the family. Uh, there's a strong genetic predisposition. It's not, of course, a single uh, gene Mendelian type of uh, genetic predisposition. It just runs in the families. And it's also related to other autoimmune diseases. If you have one classical or any type of autoimmune disease, your chance of having another one or expressing it in another way is uh, very, very high. Uh, clinically, uh, when we see autoimmune diseases, they often follow a regular known external antigenic, pathogenic uh, infections, such as strep uh, glomerulonephritis or pneumonia, which would then be followed some weeks or months later by classical expression of an autoimmune disease. Let's talk about the four classic systemic or body-wide autoimmune diseases. And always at the top of the list, number one, lupus, SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, in which the uh, antigen that is being destroyed is 
our body's own DNA. In rheumatoid arthritis, although we think of it as an arthritic expression, it's also a systemic disease and expressed uh, in many parts of the body, not just joints, but practically everywhere, of course, lungs, skin, connective tissues, as well as joints. Sjogren syndrome, often thought of as being uh, uh, a disease of salivary glands or lacrimal glands, is actually also a systemic disease. And the old uh, term scleroderma, which is now politically more correct, systemic sclerosis is also a classic systemic autoimmune diseases. These diseases were called collagen diseases in the old days. That's not a good term, although they do result in a deposition of increased collagen and fibrosis as they uh, tend towards chronicity. But the term collagen disease is no longer used. Um, let's talk about the classic local autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune orchitis, good pasture syndrome, autoimmune thrombocytopenia, pernicious anemia, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, myasthenia gravis, Graves' disease. In every single case, these are regarded as relatively local diseases. In every single case, we have an antibody attacking a known antigen or sometimes almost known antigen in a regional area of the body. In Hashimoto's, it, the antibody could be against microsomal, microsomal or uh, and thyroglobulin antibodies. In autoimmune hemolytic anemias, it's the surfaces of uh, red cells. In multiple sclerosis, it could be areas associated with uh, glial cells and myelin. Orchitis, testicle, good pasture syndrome, renal uh, glomerular basement membrane and lung areas, thrombocytopenia, the surfaces of platelets, pernicious anemia, gastric mucosal intrinsic factor, insulin-dependent diabetes, your own beta cells, myasthenia gravis, the neuromuscular junction. And isn't it interesting that the um, number one cause of Hypothyroidism in the U.S., Hashimoto's thyroiditis, is a classic autoimmune local disease, as well as the most common cause of hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease. In all of these cases, we have known antigens being destroyed uh, by antibodies or other mechanisms, uh, and that's the uh, cause or the result of the disease. Um, let's make a extremely important note here before we sign off. Autoimmune diseases, the list of autoimmune diseases grows by leaps and bounds every year. And I think you could make the general, perhaps, projection that if a disease, if an inflammatory reaction is not caused by a known external pathogen, such as a virus, a bacteria, a fungus, or whatnot, that it is very likely going to be considered to be in the group of diseases where the offending antigens are normal internal antigens. And these are autoimmune diseases, and very often diseases which have unknown etiologies are discovered to be autoimmune diseases. And remember, in every case, you have to find a normal uh, intrinsic antigen in the body that's being attacked uh, by a cell which has failed to recognize it as being uh, normal. And uh, we'll uh, start out with the mother of all of classic autoimmune diseases, lupus, in the next group. And thank you very much.